I work for a very uh, small regional organization called the Pacific Network and Globalization that's based in Fiji. And we are relatively young, um, set up in just after 2000, when in the region, the Pacific, it was felt that there was no people's movement that was specifically looking at what our governments were doing in terms of economic and trade policies. There was an absence of movement bringing together both research, knowledge, and, and, and organizing local communities to resist. And so we were born out of that particular need to be a voice at the regional level, to represent a collective of voices. And so I just want to acknowledge that our work is, you know, and the work that I'm currently doing today uh, with a small core staff really has been built on the struggles of a lot of people, particularly from the uh, nuclear free independent movement that comes before us. So I want to acknowledge that we come from that particular space. But I also want to acknowledge something that's been said this morning, and that is the strength for organizations like PANG really comes from those at the national level. And that if we don't have very strong partners at the national level, we are not able to withstand or, or to articulate the concerns of people at the national level. And also to recognize that a lot of our information and knowledge base comes from people like these sitting up front here today. I want to change tack just a little bit. And then I, I, I titled my presentation this morning, Navigating the Next Wave of the Right to Economic Self-Determination in the Pacific. Um, because we need to change tack a little bit. All the narratives around free trade is pretty similar, regardless of whether you experience it in Africa, Asia, or in the Pacific. The narrative is pretty much the same. We know the face of the beast. We know what it looks like. So I just want to change tack just a little bit uh, in my presentation today to talk about this new wave of assertion that's coming from our countries. That we, as, as, as Victor says, when we pay so much attention to trying to put out fires, we don't have the energy to begin to talk about these new alternatives. And I want to talk a little bit about that because it is quite complex and it is quite challenging. We're not new to trade in the Pacific. And so when I talk about the Pacific, I'm really just talking about the 14 independent states. We're not new to trade. I come from a region where seafarers, we are quite well known for transversing the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so we are not new to trade. But the, the new concern for us is really about corporate globalization or neoliberal, neoliberalism, if you like. Um, and so in the Pacific, the, the, the three trade agreements that we're currently having to grapple with uh, are the World Trade Organization, which is the multilateral level, the Economic Partnership Agreement, which is the free trade agreement that Pacific Island countries, including Timor-Leste, are negotiating along with Africa and Caribbean with the European Union, and the Pacific Agreement on Closer Economic Relations with Australia and New Zealand. We are aware of the super TPP that's encircling around us. And we kind of look at them like sharks. So, you know, we have one shark, well, three sharks here, and we've got the bigger ster on steroid shark that's still circling. So we are aware of the T T TPP in the sense that our major trading partners, such as Australia and New Zealand, are parties to the TPP. What they concede in the TPP negotiations is most likely going to be the platform for pay surplus negotiations. So we are aware, but we are not that actively engaged in TPP uh, for various reasons. Uh, we're extremely small in terms of staff. Uh, in terms of membership of the WTO, uh, Fiji was one of the very first, followed, followed by Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and most recently, Unfortunately, Vanuatu and Samoa have become the two most recent members to the WTO. Um, for the EPA, all 14 independent island states are included, and PESA Plus is the last one. So Fiji is not past a part of PESA Plus. But it's part of this longer process. So we've come through the whole structural adjustment process since the mid-1980s, late-1980s. And for us, we see free trade agreements as the last 
frontier. This is going to legally bind us into a type of model that does not allow for any other conversations, visions, ideals to take place. And so there has been lots of resistance uh, in the Pacific against WTO, EPA, and certainly around PESA Plus. It makes very, even less sense for us in the Pacific. Um, we have very small markets. Just by way of example, uh, Niue only has a population size of less than 2,000. You fluctuate between 2,000 and less than 2,000 because of migration. Um, Tuvalu, 12,000 people. Uh, Fiji, 800,000. And PNG being the largest, 7 million, around 7 million. But if you look at from it from a market size, it's extremely small. Makes very little sense. Low economies of scale, distances from markets. So, you know, having to track, take resources from the Pacific to Europe, the US, that takes a lot of money. And so, in some ways, it's, become, it's been our resilience that we've been so far from major markets that people have not been coming to the region. Unfortunately, that's fast changing. As resources are being depleted in other parts of the world, corporations are increasingly looking at island states as the next frontier. The distance are no longer, it doesn't really matter. Um, and so, you know, the whole idea of uh, comparative advantages just really doesn't make sense from, from small island states' uh, perspective. And the other key thing is that the cultural and social fabric of who we are as Pacific Islanders, um, which is based on the collective, is totally in opposite to and challenges this whole neoliberalism, if you like. So the actors are the same, of, you know, of those who are trying to lock us into this model of, of, of development, if you like. So they are states such as Australia, New Zealand, the European Union, um, the US, uh, supported by financial institutions such as ADB, IMF, World Bank, and increasingly, and as Ralph said this morning, elites within our own countries are also being quite, uh, are becoming part of our new struggle. Uh, but there is a shift right now that's happening in the Pacific, and the shift is happening. There are lots of reasons why this shift is happening, but I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, we've gone from a relationship of non-reciprocity, so that we have free, um, with our former colonial powers, if you like, so we have free, duty-free market access into Europe, the U.S., all based on um, historical colonial responsibilities. Now, that's, we're doing away with that. We're now being told we have to negotiate and reciprocate. Um, so that, you know, when you look at the history of, of non-reciprocal, so our trading arrangements with, uh, with some of our former colon colonial powers, we have found that it's been the cornerstone of how we have developed. So sugar has been quite critical for Fiji's development. Fisheries is certainly quite big for both Fiji, Solomons, and PNG in terms of market access into Europe and the US, Micronesia certainly into the US, government, governments and motor parts. So what's happening in the Pacific? And I want to tell a quick story because we come from a, a culture that loves to tell stories. And I want to thank the European Union and the European Commission and specifically Peter Mandelson. I know that's very strange for an activist to actually stay, say this, but for the, sh the short time that I've been engaged in Free, you know, the fight against free trade agreements, we have not been able to fully convince our governments about the dangers of these agreements. And so, you know, in 2007, all of our leaders went across to Europe. And we are a, a people that are very trusting. We are quiet. We like to believe the best in others. So we had the entourage go across to Brussels to negotiate the Economic Partnership Agreement. They went in believing firmly that this was going to be about development, that Europe cares about, about our interest. They came out shocked, horrified, and the words of quite of a few of our ministers was, never again. And I think what the European Union did quite successfully, and particularly Peter Mandelson, was that it lifted the wool from the eyes of our negotiators to see the naked machinery that's behind what we were negotiating, which is about 
damn, we want those resources, and we're going to get it however we want it. And I think it took our officials absolutely by surprise. They were not expecting that from the European uh, Commission specifically, and they were surprised. And so we've seen some conscious shift in both where our officials are, negotiators are, in some of the trade agreements. And for the first time, we're seeing countries like PNG start to say, as Ralph said this morning, we don't think it's in our interest to negotiate with Australia and New Zealand because it's not fair. It's not going to be a fair deal for our people and our, and our economies. So the shift is happening in two ways. It's political. Uh, we are seeing an assertion by uh, political structures in the Pacific around things like fisheries. So the parties of the Nauru Agreement is quite an interesting sub-regional body that wants to change the status quo around fish. Because fish, if you look at tuna, it's the biggest resource that we have in the Pacific, one of the biggest resources that we have. Yet when you look at the benefits, only 5% is accrued to Pacific Islanders. We want to change that. And so the parties of the Nauru Agreement were set up specifically to manage and conserve the resource as well as to trade and become like the, the oil cartels, if you like. And when we know, for me, one of the things that I'm always looking for is how do we measure success? How do we know that something is working? And one of the things that I, I've noticed is that when the World Bank, when the ADB consultants, uh, when the European Commission, when everybody is trying to undermine a specific initiative, you know you're onto something really good. <laughs> and the PNA is very specific, and we are seeing the European Commission, through the Economic Partnership Agreement, try to undermine the solidarity of countries trying to come together to respond both in terms of defining the economics, but also responding to the pressures, corporate pressures that's, that's coming from the outside. So that's one. We've got the Prime Minister of PNG talking about nationalizing the ownership of minerals. Unheard of. But for, 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 for an NGO such as ours, we are very clear that there is this new mood, this wave that we have to navigate now. And we have to navigate it quickly because, you know, waves. You pick up momentum and it could die. So we need to navigate the wave to ensure that, well aware of all the pressures that's coming to us, but to ensure that we're guided um, based on some fundamental principles and value systems. Uh, that we want to, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to put all our faith in terms of these political structures uh, because we're not 100% convinced yet that they're going to have a different model to the new economic liberal model. But it is our duty uh, in the Pacific to try to work with, with our, our states, our governments, to help them to come up with this new model that's going to be appropriate, that's going to safeguard. And I just want to talk a little bit about the people's movement as a way of wrapping up this session to say that there's some wonderful work happening. And, and Ralph is here and he can talk about a lot of the work that's happening in Vanuatu around the, the values of sufficiency, solidarity, inclusiveness, and participation, which comes from um, a very sacred place, which is around customary land ownership. That is where the strength of the Pacific and Pacific's people's movement come from. It comes from that. It doesn't, I mean, we may learn the language of the corporate world and we may be able to fight it, the real resistance and at the heart of this struggle is really is about how do we sustain our traditional economies within um, this very new dynamic, dynamics that's developing right now. And so I am excited and I have hope that this wave, we have momentum, we have political leadership that's coming through and I think we need to join forces more um, to help guide and navigate. So I just want to end there and say thank you again. <laughs>